Hi, everybody. Welcome to the 2023 Fellows Capstone Conversation. Right now, I'm going to be talking to this year's fellow, Lindsay Cameron, about her wonderful work. I'm Sarita Amrute, Principal Researcher at Data and Society and Director of the Fellowship Program. For anyone unfamiliar with Data and Society, we're an independent research institute studying the social implications of data and automation. We produce original research and convene multidisciplinary thinkers to challenge the power and purpose of technology in society. Data and Society began nine years ago in New York City, an island node in a large network of hills, rivers, and mountains in the Atlantic Northeast known as Lenape Hoking, the ancestral lands of the Lenni Lenape people. Today, we are connected online via a different network, a vast array of servers, humans, and computers. In the United States, much of this system sits on stolen land acquired under the extractive logic of white settler expansion. As an organization, we recognize this history and uplift the sovereignty of indigenous people, data, and territory around the world. We commit to dismantling all ongoing settler colonial practices and their material implications on our digital worlds. We started this type of fellowship three years ago to recognize the importance of questions of race and analogous concepts like caste when studying, developing, and using emerging technologies. This year's fellows are convening interdisciplinary groups to talk through shared analysis and points of difference in their respective fields, coming up with nuanced ways to engage with the intersections of tech and race. I'm going to hand the mic over to Lindsay now for a quick introduction, and then I'll talk a little bit about my work, then we'll have a conversation back and forth about what we've been working on. Wonderful. Thank you so much for uh, inter for that beautiful um, introduction and for inviting me to be part of Data and Society this, this past year in a more formal role. So I'm an assistant professor of management at the Warden School at the University of uh, Pennsylvania, and then I also have a secondary appointment in the Department of Sociology. And all of my, my research is focused on around algorithmic management, really centering workers' experience and how do they respond to these changes that are happening in the workplace. Probably my biggest study that I'm most well known for is an ethnography of ride hailing. So those are your Ubers, your Lyft, your Junos. I actually worked part-time for a ride hailing company for about three years, but I've also studied other platforms such as TaskRabbit and Instacart and all the food delivery platforms. So yeah, that's really what my work centers around is the human experience in being algorithmically managed. Mm, yeah. And, you know, for those of you who don't know me yet, I wrote a book about uh, programmers and race and class and tech worlds. And I was specifically looking at the experience of coders from India in short term coding contracts. Um, the book's called um, Encoding Race and Coding Class. And Lindsay, to your point about humanizing the experience of working in tech, I think that was really what I was after, too. I think, you know, we often have these assumptions of what gig workers are or what coders are, and it turns out their lived reality is very, very different. Um, and now I'm trying to work on a, pro a, a project that extends that focus to also include cast as a really important uh, vector for discrimination and value production in, in tech economies. Um, and, you know, one thing I wanted to ask you just off the bat is what drew you to the fellowship and what has the experience been like? Well, one, I love your work. You know, I think that the bigger question that brought me to Data Society is I, I've been like a, a cherished guest, it feels like, uh, coming there for paper workshops over the years and knew it was a like-minded group of people I wanted to spend time with. And I, I think why this fellowship and why now is that I've always used more of a labor lens to look at my work and looking at the power asymmetries and focused on the tech. And race is, it's like the hidden elephant that's in the room, that race obviously is there. You know, I have a huge corpus of data, you know, hundreds of interviews st stretching over six years and and archival data, my own experience as an African-American woman driving in these platforms. And I was just curious to see what my data was going to say about race or what could it say. And so I took this opportunity in the fellowship to explore 
something that I probably wouldn't have explored before because I was very comfortable using this one lens to think about my data. So I use this time, you know, as a time to go to go deeper into something I wouldn't have gone to otherwise, and also to think about what does it mean to frame uh, research for more of a public audience and not just an academic journal. And how has that been? I mean, I, I, I can hear what you're saying about race being this elephant in the room that's hard to really describe. You, you know, as we know, you grab the tail of the elephant, it feels like one thing, the ear feels like something else. Over the course of your year, have you come to any conclusions about how we can think through the, the intersection of race and tech work? Conclusion, no, <laughs> very much in progress. But I am seeing it come through in a few different uh, ways in my data. So the first thing that I, I did is sort of went through all the data I've collected, these thousands of pages, to see how many instances there were of race. And honestly, there, there weren't that many, you know, 50 at the most, 40. And then I then went out and did a separate data collection around video diaries, where, you know, often people will talk uh, and make these videos on Instagram. Insta, um, Instagram or TikTok or YouTube that is talking about their experience and they're centering then what's important to them about race. So that allowed me to get a bit more uh, selective. And so there's that those sort of data points. I did another archival uh, round of collection and then reading and, and thinking about this, you know, it feels like race is operating at multiple levels. They're sort of at the, the more, the, the larger level around predatory inclusion. So, hey, we now you get to be an entrepreneur, you get to have control of your own time. And for a group of workers that have been deemed a, the service class, you know, quote unquote, in American society, this seems to be a good thing. And so this is, I think their race is operating at a much more higher level as a term of like occupational sorting. Even when you look at the advertisements for these companies, they're often a black or brown person that's helping someone that, that's white. So there's some, some racial implications right there. But even, then looking in through the data, seeing about what it looks like in the interact, interactional day-to-day, um, -day, there is, of course, people who talk about Instacarting while Black or flexing while Black, where they might go into a neighborhood where they're the only one to do a delivery and they've been attacked by dogs or people have pointed weapons on them, talked about discrimination they've gotten when they've been followed around or not allowed to use the bathroom in certain stores. So these, these stories around... Um, discrimination and pain points. And then there are also stories of celebration. There was one driver who felt like it was his job to be the cultural ambassador of blackness in his, his Uber car. And so he purposely played music by like Drake and Chance the Rapper who are more socially conscious uh, hip hop rap rappers. So he could have a conversation with people around race and, and consciousness, black consciousness. And then there was another writer I talked to who carried around these little leaflets of people who had been victims who had been killed by the police and handed them out to people to again have conversations in their car. So in that point, it, it was around using issues around race to, to spark conversations. So to, to go back to your initial question of how I'm seeing race, I'm seeing it being operationalized in, in different levels, like both at the sort of the higher level occupational, then sort of by the stores or in the, like at the customers when people are doing these deliveries. And then in particularly in the car, I'm seeing both these sort of positive and negative interactions that are race-based. Mm, that's really amazing. And I think, you know, in our analysis of race and, and tech, uh, it's high time that we get accounts, and there are some, that don't only focus on really obvious forms of discrimination to the exclusion of some of these other lived practices of race, some of which are can be really joyful. Um, so in my current work on, on cast and tech, I'm also trying to track moments where cast oppressed communities really use the the spaces that are afforded them to you know as you were saying kind of celebrate the Dalit experience in the same way that someone might be celebrating the black experience and it also makes me think about not only the the gig work of it but the car too as this really interesting space that's different than say an Instacart shopper. It's, it's a different kind of relationship. I wonder if you're theorizing the intimacy 
of driving at all and maybe thinking through your own experience driving mm -hmm. um you know how are you thinking about that yeah, the car is the one example I have, I think, out of the seven platforms where I see more of the celebratory aspect. And I think it's, you know, you, you either own your car or maybe you're renting it on a longer term contract through a company. And people, I call this part of the relational game in one of my papers where folks decorate their car with unicorn stickers or the party light. So it's a conversation piece or people will promote their businesses. I remember uh, there was one driver who said, I'm here to uplift you. And it was written on his flyers and it was U-P-L-Y-F-T for uplift. And he had these crystals all around his car. So those are other examples in addition to sort of these race interactions where people are using the car as, as a point of connection. You know, in, in Instacart, I have a paper about workers and how they see themselves as heroes or not, you know, during the during the height of the pandemic. And there it's more, I find, an imaginary that folks are making about who their customer is. So my mm -hmm. customer is immunocompromised. My customer is a single mother with children. And they have these imagined communities or imagined people they're serving in their mind when they're going out to doing the shopping. And that helps them become a hero. So they're less in the concrete, but then sort of making the work, having a more emancipatory or positive, you know, vibe to it. Yeah. And these are such complicated relationships because as, you know, as I, I tried to argue in some of my pieces, it's not all of these categories become really productive of a particular form of techno capitalism. So, you know, as much as things are celebrated and celebratory, I'm always aware of there's a kind of way in which they both resist and feed systems of oppression. I think that's the tension that you see in, in this setting as well. And it's the tension I feel like is actually very productive that in that it keeps people pulled into this work, this, this logic of entrepreneurship with actually you're being managed by the algorithm and the choices you can make are very small. Is these two things can, can fuel or actually make people more deeply committed to the work. Because I came in, you know, being influenced by all the public pieces that had been written about ride hailing and thinking that, it, you know, in some ways it was going to be a bad experience or negative thoughts about the platform. And one way that I really had to, to check myself as I was collecting the data is a lot of drivers really did like this work and they had legitimate reasons for liking it. And so a lot of my research is about looking at this tension and how how people are holding the both ends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how does that when you then present your work to people in your discipline or other disciplines, what are some points of disagreement or tension that might arise or how has it shaped your philosophy toward the field? I feel like for a lot of people, it, they can I confuse them because they think I'm going to say something that's quite different than what I say. So <laughs> I'm in a management department. There are a lot of strategy people and they're like, so you're not looking at firm performance. And I'm mm -hmm. like, I have no interest in the firm. Like I, have, I don't even have that much interest in Uber and Lyft as a company. I'm interested in ride hailing and technology. And then at the same time, when I go into spaces, I think where critical thinking is more uh, firmly established, you know, in comms or in sociology, I can be seen to be taking a much more positive viewpoint because I'm trying to explain the tensions and how they work and, you know, create like create a viable sense of self for the drivers that's real and authentic, as opposed to just being like, you know, bad platform, bad workers, extractive capitalism. And so I, you know, I think there are obviously there are other people that think like me, but I often feel like I'm in the in between of sort of two major, like two of the mainstream conversations that are out there. I actually have a conversation that's more in the middle between those two. Yeah. And one thing you mentioned at the top of the conversation is when you came to Day into Data and Society, you came with a sense of wanting to do more public facing work or maybe more collaboration. So how does that sense of in-betweenness, feeling in between? And I, I think I can really relate to that too, because I think my work also feels very in-between sometimes. Um, you know, how have you pursued collaborations over your time here in public facing work? That's a great question that I feel like I'm still actually in the middle of, of living in and, and figuring out. Let me see if I have a good answer. 
You know, I think right now I'm actually still in trying to be in the conversation and understanding these different themes. So I'm having a micro convening around race and gig work that is, is moving my, my thought forward. I've co-authored pieces with people that are quite different from me that have been more public facing. And at the end, I think I'm always looking at that work and I'm like, hmm, that's actually not what I think I think, but I did learn a lot from writing that. And so I'm kind of, I'm like, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure yet about how, how I'm approaching it or how I'm thinking through it. I'll be at the Institute for Advanced Studies next year uh, in Princeton. And so I think it gives me more time to keep on living in that question because I am in the earlier stages in my career. So there's not yet, it doesn't yet feel like there is a pressure to be part of the public conversation. It's more just something I feel myself arcing toward. Yeah, and I, I first of all, congratulations. That's amazing. You get a year to think and mm -hmm. enjoy, so that's wonderful. And you'll be close to New York, so that's always nice for us. Yeah. Um, but one thing that I think I've learned from my time at Data and Society is to think about multiple publics rather than a public. I find that it's a little bit too much pressure, in a sense, to think that I could write or speak for an imagined public that is the US or maybe in even international reading public. Um, but instead, I've started to think about what kinds of pieces or even what kinds of methods uh, of communication can reach different kinds of audiences. So one of my favorite things that I did last year was this uh, primer that I worked on with two colleagues at Data and Society, Ranjit Singh and Rigoberto Lara Guzman, called AI in, uh, in and from the majority world. And it was a really extensive syllabus project with a lot of collaborators. You know, we did it, we worked on it. I really didn't know what would become of it, but I was just at a series of events uh. virtually last week and I wasn't really aware until that moment of how many people had found something of value in it. So, you know, sometimes I think we might, our work, if it's if it's written in a particular way, it might have a much, it might have a kind of longevity that we ourselves can't predict because of course it's a text and then it goes out in the world or a video or whatever um, and people pick it up in all these other ways. So. I'm really excited to hear that you have some time to think and work on it. And maybe you could talk a little bit more about what you're imagining what you might do with these video diaries, because that's a really interesting method. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about how you arrived at that method and you know where you where you see it going. So I arrived at that only because there was so little data about race in my main corpus as compared to, to how large the amount was. And it's, you know, if you just giggle race and insert the name of your favorite gig economy company, there are a lot of people who have a lot of things they 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 say that they feel like they've been treated unfairly in one way or another. And, you know, I think one of the ways I got um, insight that this could be valuable is when I was doing my Instacart project, there was a woman, when I asked her about some of the challenges of being on the platform, she said, well, you know, it's like these other people, they like just don't know how to shop. And then she gave an example about a man who would just like pick avocados and put it in the basket without testing their hardness. And then she talked about a woman who would go shopping with her children and how she felt like that is against the rules. And so she would actually write messages to Instacart saying, hey, this person is not following the rules. They are shopping with their children. And I just remember like filing in my head thinking it's interesting because you're basically tattling on your coworkers. You're like filling in the gap of where the algorithm can't monitor. And so mm -hmm. you're sharing that information. The groceries are still being picked up and delivered. And so I was talking to um, an organizer, I think a few months later, and I happened to mention this because, you know, he's he was in the on the ground and in, in the trenches in a very deep way. And he's like, oh, you need to check out Facebook. There are hundreds of black women who maybe he didn't say hundreds, but he said many Black women who have been accused of shopping with their children and then being kicked out of the platform. And, you know, I had you know, the woman I interviewed, her, her race was white, but she didn't tell me the race of the people that she was calling on. And then it kind of clicked 
aha, this is a racially encoded interaction that I wouldn't have seen or she wouldn't have used the language for explicitly. And that's what led me to the video diaries and to collect them. So how I see this actually coming out, it might actually be a public piece because it's a mix of the data, but I also think it'll be an also an essay about why we miss this or why is it hard to get a handle around thinking about race and, and gender and labor in nexus or intersectional with one another. Because there are things that uh, both I missed as a researcher when I was collecting data. Uh, you know, there I would be talking to people who are ride hailing drivers and they would talk about, um, you know, I'd ask about a negative experience. And one of them talked about a woman who put her head outside the car. She was a, a white woman and she screamed, F the police. And the guy was like, yeah, that wasn't safe. And he was a black guy and I didn't follow up because I knew what he meant. And there were many black men who talked about being arrested and then how, or not arrested, but being stopped. And then, you know, when they had, we were able to explain because they had this person in the car that was a different race of them, then they were let go. And again, I didn't question those. I didn't probe further because I was a black woman. I felt like I understood part of the trauma or the story that they were telling. And I didn't want to go further or to interrogate the pain. Yeah. And so I think that's another reason to your reason of why I find race to be a I found race to be a bit silent is I think because of my own presupposed knowledge is that I didn't go further in those questions that maybe somebody else might have done. Mm. You know, one thing I always appreciate <clears throat> about you, your work, your research methodologies is this incredible humility you have with your own process. I mean, it's amazing. I've learned so much this year from just watching you go back and revise and question and really deeply interrogate the relationship between race and its erasure and how we all are embodied in the field. And it's just, it's just great. It's so amazing to hear you talk about that. And I'm sure your students really appreciate that as well. Because I think sometimes graduate students, especially we unwittingly train them to go into the field as if, you know, as if the, the, grant proposal they wrote to do the work is what they're going to stick to. But just hearing you play that out, those experiences, uh, really, I think it's a really amazing suppleness to your work that shows in the in the uh, methodologies and also the papers you've been able to write. So I appreciate you sharing that with us. It's yeah, great. thank you. It's like the using the body as an instrument. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's in, right. In the field, yeah. I mean, one thing maybe we could both share for listeners at home, you know, we're both university professors. We've we've chosen this path for ourselves. And and I'm wondering, you know, what what would what wisdom, I mean, you're still very young, so wisdom maybe is the wrong word, but nascent experience about being in academia as a black woman. What would you want to share with people out there who are listening, who are maybe already in academia, thinking about coming into academia from, from where you sit? This is a second career for me. I was a hacker in the government for career number one. So I entered PhD program at 29, which is above average in my discipline. I think usually people are more like 25 to 27 or something like that. And you know, there's a clear knowing of like why I'm here and what I was arcing to, arcing toward. I've always loved the word triple threat, you know, someone who can do research, consulting and teaching together, consulting, being engaged with the world. And I knew, yes, I want to be a triple threat. And like, that's like been my steadiness or my purpose that I, that I've held on to for a long time. And then you've asked about, you know, maybe, you know, unique reflections of being a black woman. And I would, you know, I'm going to, my story, I feel like, or my narrative is different from what I've heard other people say, because I feel like in general, things go swimmingly well, you know, and I, you know, I think, <laughs> you know, it could be a larger conversation about maybe there's colorism or, you know, it depends on, you know, where I went to school from. But in general, I have found, I've created my own community and I have found people being very welcome to let me into your community. Like, I feel like, being part of data society is like going to a woman's college. Like I wish I had gone <laughs> to a woman's college, seeing how many strong, independent women, you know, what they're like. I feel like, wow, data society women, they're all kind of like me. 
And so, I mean, I think I've been very fortunate to find people to be my mentors and to be my sponsors. When I was just thinking about research ideas, I wanted to, I saw my mother lost her job in the Great Recession. It was 2008 and watched her go from being a manager to basically doing all this odd gig work, like, you know, selling samples in grocery stores and working in a warehouse. And I was really interested in downward social mobility. And the person that ended up, you know, becoming my advisor is a large scale, quantitative, big data set person, not an ethnographer like me, but was really willing to engage with me around questions of downward social mobility and theoretically what that means. Mm -hmm. And so that that's my, you know, I feel like when I say like things work out, like people, you know, some people would have been like, oh, that's race or gender, like good for you. That's going to be really important. But I happen to find that people are like, no, this is actually theoretically valuable. And I'm going to help guide you on sort of how to craft that, you know, as a as, as a contribution. So, you know, doors and windows open. And when you don't see a way, you make a way. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I feel very blessed and, and fortunate. So I, I'm curious maybe just to sort of to 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 ask you, you know, to break the the wall. What has your experience been like? Yes, I think I would completely agree with the idea of making your own community. I think, and, and to have a community outside of what uh, is meant to be the boundaries of a particular community. So I think it's really important to look beyond your particular university, beyond your department, beyond, beyond your subfield and look for people who are interested in not even necessarily the same questions, but the same ethic when it comes to asking questions that you have. Um, I think it is very important to find women and women of color to talk to because in fact, there are things that, that need to be shared uh, in those spaces and those are really, really different spaces. And then finally for me, my trajectory has been that I was trained in a really um, disciplinarily strong but somewhat hidebound anthropology department at the University of Chicago. I really loved being in graduate school, actually, that people tell a lot of horror stories about the rigor of University of Chicago, but that's what I wanted. Uh, I really loved it. And I was very happy there as a grad student. Um, and then I went to an academic job at the University of Washington in an anthropology department again, where I found a lot of wonderful colleagues, but um, I needed to sort of find my own way. It was clear after a few years that I needed to spread my wings a little bit and build community outside the narrow confines of a particular discipline. And sometimes that requires being, taking chances, you know, being open to not really knowing what the next steps are, which is quite honestly how I came to data and society. And now um, I have a job that I love at Parsons, which is a design school. And we were talking about this earlier, but I feel a little bit like an imposter there. But on the other hand, it feels really good because it's sort of hitting that sweet spot for me, which is the real theoretical critical piece, meeting people who are trying to make things, whether it's an object or a system. And I really love that challenge of translating the critical findings into something that's existing in the world. Um, and so it feels right. So it's sort of a circuitous attempt, a way to get there. But I think for women, for women of color in the academy, it's just so important to not accept the terms of your existence that you've been told uh, not accept them as yours and create your own terms for what how you want to be in the world. That's the, and it takes time, it takes work, but I mean, I think it can be incredibly rewarding. And, you know, it's nothing that can ever be done in isolation or alone. It always has to be done in solidarity with others. And that's what I get so much from these conversations and the fellowships. It's been amazing. Yeah. You know, I do occasionally do have this feeling where like I'm walking in the hallways and I'm like, wow, 50 years ago, this wouldn't have been possible at all. And it's not imposter syndrome. It's this, wow, structurally, the world has changed so much. And it's like a 
like it's a sharp intake or gas. And mm -hmm. so for me, you know, when I, it's more like this, this ancestral reckoning that, that mm -hmm. sort of comes to me at times when I think about, you know, the privilege of being in this position. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah, you're bringing your ancestors with you to the hallways. Yeah. And <laughs> they all continue to disrupt because, you know, the hallways, as you mentioned, colorism, elitism, both of us come from pretty elitist institutions, if I can say that. Maybe that needs to Harvard be. Harvard is elite, <laughs> elitist, elitist. <laughs> so thinking thinking more about what we can do to keep keep that spirit of rebellion alive. I think that's where I want to move. Yeah. And, you know, I, you know, just the best form of rebellion is often flourishing and to bring other people around who are flourishing with you, too. And yeah. I think that's really what's been so amazing. It's spending this year at Data and Society. It's like it's contributing to this flourishing. I, there's no way not no way, but I don't feel like I would have been prepared to go to IAS and to step in to this theme of platforms if it wasn't for, you know, this sort of groundwork that I've been helping to build with data and society and I hope to continue. It's, you know, it's all in a journey as we're all arcing forward together. Mm, I love it. I, I can tell that arcing is one of your key words and I think it's a word I'm going to take with me. Thank you, Lindsay. This has been a lovely conversation. Um, and I'm looking forward to collaborating with you for all the years, for all the years going forward. Thank you. Thank you. You too.